speaker tonight. Um, his name is uh, Doug Lay or Professor Lay. Um, and some of you guys may not know, Shandy and I actually went to the same Bible college, St. Louis Christian College, but um, we went at different times. Uh, but both of us, if you were to ask us, who was your favorite professor from Bible college? Um, separately, we would both tell you uh, that, it's, that it's Prof. Lay. Um, Prof. Lay is an awesome teacher of the Bible, an awesome pastor, and an awesome man of God. Um, one thing that's kind of funny about Doug is uh, last time he came and spoke um, at something of ours, he, uh, he slapped a student because he got so excited. I think it was Will. He just slapped him right in the face. Uh, it, was, it was pretty funny, actually. So first row, you got to beware a little bit. Um, I went out to eat with Doug uh, earlier tonight uh, with another mutual friend of ours, and um, I don't even know what the context was. Somebody said woke, and, uh, and Doug said, what's a woke, and started typing it in on Google, what is a woke? Um, but even though Doug doesn't know what a woke is, uh, one of the things that I have always appreciated and loved about Doug is that um, no matter the distance uh, and no matter who you are, uh, Doug it will genuinely want to get to know you. He will genuinely want to talk to you, um, and he will genuinely uh, push you to become uh, more like Jesus and to live your life more like Jesus. And so uh, with that, Doug, why don't you come on up and, and uh, make sure and talk with him later, and thank him for, for coming out for us tonight. So. Good evening, everyone. You really had you really had telling the woke joke, didn't you? I have to sign, make you sign a waiver next time I go out to dinner with you that anything I say to you cannot be said. <laughs> How you doing, all? Let's pray, Father. And you are worthy, and that's why we're gathered here. We're we're going to be like Mary tonight and sit at your feet and let you teach us. Because uh, Father, if you don't teach us and we don't surrender to you, uh, we have no hope. And Father. We come here this evening with, from different journeys and different destinations and even different reasons tonight. Uh, but Father, you know, and I, it's always been a little frightening to me, Father, that you know everyone here that's here this evening and you know their path and for whatever reason how they ended up here tonight. So uh, I don't know what you have for them, Father, through your word and through your spirit, but you just do what you do to speak to us individually and corporately, because um, you are a good father. In Jesus' name, amen. So who are the, those of you who have a major in the humanities department, please raise your hand. See, I knew there'd be one. I gotta count, I want, I'm not a, this won't, this won't take long. One, keep them up, two, three, four, four, five. Okay, so for, the, for those of you who don't know, English, communications, philosophy, religion, uh, and really that's my educational background. Undergrads, religion, theology, one bachelor's degrees in English, uh, linguistics, literature. Uh, I've also in Spanish, uh, I do a little philosophy now and then. So, so for the five of you, here's my question. The rest of you, assuming you're not humanities and assuming you're math and science, whatever else this school is, this is for the five of you, because I know you don't feel loved and you feel isolated here. So as a fellow humanities person, I have a question for the five of you and the rest of you, just whatever you do. You get on your phone, call your mother. Okay, for the five of you, here it is. Can you be a triangle and not have three straight lines? How do you torture, how do you torture an engineering student? You ask them a rhetorical question. Exactly. See, that's exactly what I would expect from you, for you math and science people. So Nathaniel made me come up with a, a title, and that's it. Can you be a triangle without three straight lines? And I thought, I don't know, last time I checked, I, I have a four-year-old granddaughter who lives with me, and I've been teaching her the shapes, squares, triangles, rectangles, hexagon, hexagon and a pentagon. My four-year-old granddaughter has known all those since she was two. So she knew what a triangle was. I asked my wife, she's an elementary school teacher. She knew what a triangle was. I went on Google, they know what a triangle is. So, a couple of months before I came, I uh, went out to breakfast. Where is he? There he is over there, Kyle. And a friend of his who remained nameless. So I'm at breakfast with an engineer, an engineer to be in, who's the other guy? Oh yeah, okay. So, I said to them, 
I thought, well, I'm going to go to engineering school, so I got to test this out. So I said to them, can you be a triangle without three straight lines? Now, I'm a humanities guy. That is a rhetorical question, okay? It doesn't require an answer, okay? Because the answer is obvious. And I turned, and I thought, there he goes. He's like a coyote after a baby rabbit. <laughs> and I could see him going, I thought, there he goes. He thinks this is a question to be answered, to be, to discover something new. And he did. For, well, I don't know, 10 minutes, he's sitting there, and he's even talking to you. And I had hope, better hopes for you because you, you were still in school. <laughs> what, 10, 15 minutes later? And maybe you can tell. He turns to me and says, Prof. Le, and then he gives me, straight face, a legitimate explanation that you could have a triangle without three straight lines. Didn't he something about 3D something? Something, I don't know. And I thought, I knew it, I knew it. I, I, I can't even take a question that I'd asked my four-year-old granddaughter. I can't even ask a bunch of engineering students in Rolla. Now, fortunately, Kyle emailed me or texted me later that night and basically said, don't worry, Prof. Le, a triangle has to have three lines, right? Okay. I initially said, can you be a triangle with only three lines? And I thought, no, I better define what kind of line. So I did stick in straight line for some of you. By the way, I have ADD. <laughs> I don't want my engineers to have ADD. I want them to be focused when they're building a bridge. But in case you've never had a professor who's ADD, here we go. And this is with Ritalin, by the way. Nathaniel asked me to come speak, not based on the book, but based on the date. And you'll see later, hopefully. This is the only Thursday that I can come. I teach at another school. I have class on Friday, but they have fall break. This is the only Thursday I told him that I could come for the entire semester. So I said, sign me up. So then he told me, Philemon. And I first thought, really? Philemon. Uh, I've been a pastor for many years. I've taught Romans, Revelation. You ask 10 pastors, put them in a room and ask them, what are the most five significant books in the Bible? It doesn't matter what five books they tell you. What they will not tell you is the book of Philemon. <laughs> and I have to be honest with you, I've never officially taught Philemon. And there was, I was a little bitter because I wanted Haggai. But you had that another day. So I thought, okay, we'll do Philemon. It's a letter. And even though it's a short letter and you think it's easy to understand, it's not. Uh, when my father passed away in 2011, I found a letter that my grandmother had written to me in 1976 when I was in college. And I picked it up and hadn't seen it in, what, 40 years? I picked it up five seconds later. I thought, I got this thing down. If I showed all of you really smart people my grandmother's letter, it would take you longer. The very nature of a letter is there is a whole host of information that is missing. And that's the point. So when you write to your mother, or whatever you do with your mother, text your writer, I know you don't write notes, uh, letters anymore. Uh, I thought about doing a class. This is an envelope, this is a stamp, this is how you write, this is how you write a letter. <laughs> but when you write a letter to someone you know, there's a whole host of information that you don't put in the letter. So it makes a letter difficult to understand if you're not the recipient is you have to read between the lines. So you can read Philemon in a minute and a half, but you have to go and you gotta fill in the lines. So there's a lot of stuff that he, Paul doesn't specifically tell us. And so for those of you who like things to be exact, black and white, you, we're just gonna to torture you tonight. Because it's not, and you're gonna say, did Paul really say that? Well, he did, but it's in between the lines of the letter. So instead of just reading the letter and sort of doing a typical exegetical message. I just want to talk to you about three people. The first one is Onesimus. You know, I've been practicing that name for a week. Onesimus, see? Look, look. I know what my profession is. I'm an English teacher. So if I mispronounce a word or spell it wrong, which I don't have, I'm spelling impaired, you don't have to tell me, hey, aren't you an English professor? Yes, I am. <laughs> you only need to tell me when I'm in the nursing home and I don't have my memory anymore. You were an English professor. No, I wasn't. I worked for the FBI. <laughs> Onesimus. So I want to tell you about him. This is all you need to know about Onesimus. One, he's a, he's a, he is a fugitive. 
because he's a slave who has run away. Two, he's a thief because he stole from his master. And three, when he did this, he was not a Christian. So I'll give him a little bit of slack. He didn't know any better. And look, if you're a slave and you have the chance to escape and take financial resources from your master that will help you escape, why wouldn't you? So he leaves Colossae, which is in modern-day Turkey, and he eventually makes his way to Rome. Great place to go if you're going to hide out. And then the most ironic thing happens. Now, that's a humanities term, irony. I was teaching a literature class, and we were teaching the students about, okay, when you read a piece of literature, this is what rain means. Like when you're watching a movie, and they're, they're at the funeral home, I mean, they're at the cemetery, and it's raining. That is a metaphor for? Oh, my gosh. Some of you do. Okay. Wow. Okay. So we spend the whole semester, and we teach them, okay, this metaphor means this, this means this, this means this, this means this, this means this. Sunrise is a positive metaphor. Sunrise, sunset is a negative metaphor. And we go the whole semester. And then near the end, I say, oh, by the way, I got one more. It's called irony. And irony basically says, everything I told you all semester is wrong. Okay? <laughs> So we can, we lie to you, and we switch it. The story of Onesimus is classic irony. He is a fugitive slave who is free, but he has to look over his shoulder because in the Roman law, if he's caught, his, his owner can have him crucified, fed to wild animals, uh, flogged, branded, uh, have him do uh, forced labor. So he has to spend his time in Rome, in a sense, looking around. And isn't it ironic that he runs into a man who is in prison for a crime in which he did not commit in order to be introduced to Jesus. Onesimus found Jesus, most likely, through the ministry of the Apostle Paul, who is in prison. If I'm Paul, I'm ticked off. Let me see, I'm in prison, I didn't break a law, but I'm here because I'm a Christian, and you are a fugitive, but you're free. I might say, I'm not sure I'm going to share the gospel with him. Onesimus becomes a Christian. And even Paul even hints at it when he, he tells Philemon. He says, you know, Philemon, when he was with you, he was of no value to you, but he is of value to me. And his name actually means helpful. Now, I know a number of my friends who name their children after Bible names, and so if any of you are at some point need to come up with a name for your child. You need to name your child Anesimus. Okay, I've never met anyone with that name, but here's why. This is going to be great, because your child's like six years old, and you say, Onesimus, clean your room. Because the name means helpful. Helpful, help me mow the yard. Helpful, help me wash the dishes. No, Dad, I don't want to wash the dishes. But you have to, because you are Dad, why didn't you name me Moses? Okay. And Paul says, and this is reading between the lines, Onesimus had no, in his calendar, okay, run away from my owner, run to Rome, hide out from the law, you know, find a job, and nowhere on his calendar of what his goals were was to meet Jesus. And that is true for all of us. And for those of you here this evening who know Jesus and whenever you met him, you didn't plan it. You didn't sit down at age six, okay, when I'm 12, I wanted this, when I'm 14, this, when I'm 18, this, graduate from college, get married, and then I want to meet Jesus. We don't plan to meet him. He meets us. And Paul assumes, as he's writing, that what people would have thought was a coincidence is not. That the power and sovereignty of God is he takes a slave in Colossae in Turkey and makes it so that he ends up in Rome and of all the places for him to hide out in Rome at some point he comes in contact with Paul or with contact with people who are connected with the church in Rome that are connected with Paul and he finds Jesus. So I can imagine him telling Paul his testimony. Hey Paul you won't believe what happened. I used to be a slave but now I'm free. I think there's a song we can sing about that. That's messed up. It's an old hymn, and you guys only sing new stuff. Okay, some of this is like being at the airport and with a plane go over your head. 
it's okay. Because <laughs> not everything makes sense. Because this is how this works. Some of the illustrations apply to Philemon, and some of them don't. And why I'm talking to you, I don't have a clue. What's your name? I'm Mike. Hi, Mike. <laughs> I won't remember your name, but. So he's telling Paul his testimony. And, and if I'm Paul, when Paul writes to Philemon, he says, you know what, Obes Onesimus, he's not only become a Christian, he's very helpful to me. And Paul describes him as a co-worker. So now, think about this. Onesimus has met Jesus, and what God has done to forgive him of his sins has now given him a ministry with the Apostle Paul. Yesterday I was not a Christian, I met Jesus today, and tomorrow I'm working for Billy Graham. I mean, I can't go any higher than working for the Apostle Paul. And I'm telling you, if, if that had happened today, I can tell you church leaders who would have said to Onesimus, isn't that, isn't that amazing that the grace of God, that he saved you, made you meet Paul, you become a Christian, and now you have a, a meaningful ministry with the Apostle Paul. Isn't that amazing? And then Onesimus says, well, yeah, but I'm a fugitive, and I'm a thief, and my master, he also is a Christian. In fact, he actually sort of has a church that meets in his house, but... Oh, it doesn't matter, because if you had read in the book of Romans, which Paul hasn't written yet, <laughs> it is a different crowd when I talk to Bible college students. You can do Bible college jokes, but anyway. There is now no condemnation, in Je in, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. Onesimus, Jesus has forgiven you of your sins, and that includes running away from your master, and it includes being a thief. So Onesimus, don't worry about it. Just praise Jesus that he's given you a new ministry. And this is the irony of this story. Because the reason that Philemon, Paul's writing this letter is, Philemon, I'm sending Onesimus back to you. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is absurd. Why are you going back? Because when he goes back, he has no guarantee that his owner, Philemon, is going to call the police, going to call the Roman government, have him arrested, have him crucified. And, or he might say, you know what, you're not coming back. This is, you betrayed me. Really, you think I'm going to take you back? Why in the world is Onesimus going back to Philemon? And by the way, even though it says Paul says I'm sending him to you, Read between the lines. This is a decision that Onesimus is making. This is his free will. That the gospel is so powerful, God wants to restore your relationship with him. But he also wants to restore your relationship with everyone else. And you can't have it, Jesus, but I don't want my roommate. Jesus, and I don't want my uncle. Jesus, I don't want X, Y, and Z. And that for him to be restored to Philemon is so important that he's going to go back. And he becomes this picture of what we call theologically repentance, confession. And he's going to go back and repent. And this is one of the reasons why we need the book of Philemon. Because some of you are, I told you, Onesimus. Some of you who have become Christians, you committed some, let's say, you, you, you committed some behaviors where before you were a Christian, you hurt some people. But now that you're a Christian, and you're so grateful that God has forgiven you of even of the sins you committed before you were a Christian, the assumption now is, I can move on. This is a true story of a young man in his 20s, committed murder in his mid-30s, becomes a Christian, goes and tells his pastor, uh, this is what I did when I was 20. And then he goes and turns himself in, gets arrested, and is currently in jail. Non-Christians don't understand that story. But when it, when it came out in the news, what surprised me is the number of Christians who didn't understand the story. Who said, what an idiot. Why did he turn himself in? Jesus forgave him of the sin of murder. David committed murder. David didn't go to jail. God forgave him of the murder. He had no obligation to turn himself in. 
And when you become a Christian, particularly later in your life, there's a sense of if any of the sins and any of the, th- any of the people that you hurt when you were not a Christian, you may think, I have no responsibility. And that's why we need the book of Philemon. Because you do. My younger brother, who's 59, uh, became a Christian 12, 13, 14 years ago. Uh, he's been a recovering alcoholic for 20 years. So all of his alcoholic days, which started in middle school, was, is when he was not a Christian. So he became a Christian, and I remember he told me, um, he went back to my father, who's not a Christian, and said, Dad, I'm going to pay back all the money that you paid to get me out of jail when I used to get drunk. And of course, my dad was offended and said, no. And my dad said, well, why would you do that? And my brother said, one, because it's one of the steps of the 12-step program, but number two, <laughs> there we go, there we go, there we go. It really is one of the steps. But number two, God, this is the message of Philemon. Jesus forgives you of your sins, but your sins leave consequences. I've done a lot of premarital counseling. I don't do it anymore. I don't know why, but anyway. And the stories I hear about, someone will say, yeah, I grew up, but my father at some point left. Now, if they say, my father left us when I was six, but he wasn't a Christian, okay. But then what happens is somewhere down the line, the father becomes a Christian. And then the question is, should I go back and try to be reconciled to my adult children for leaving them even though I was not a Christian? And I've had some Christians tell me, no, you are under no obligation to try to go back and be reconciled to your adult children because you weren't a Christian. That's why we need the book of Philemon because you need to go back and try to be reconciled with your children and say, look, I'm a Christian now. And you want to demonstrate the grace of God in a non-Christian's life, you go do that. Even in a Christian's life. Particularly a Christian who's a legalistic, pharisaical attitude. Because it's unexplainable in light of our human reasoning. Is why would you go make restitution? This is what one of the criticisms that non-Christians have of, of as Christians. You guys can sin, you just ask Jesus to forgive you, and then nothing happens. There's no consequences. And as Christians... We are forgiven of our sins, but King David committed murder, and I used to say adultery. And if you want to talk to me about this later, I will. David raped Bathsheba. God forgave him. Read Psalm 51. But God said, the child that Bathsheba will give birth to will die. Two, what you did in private, David, will happen in public. And one of David's wives is raped in public on the roof of the king. And the more more severe punishment, David, you will have family dysfunction, particularly with his son Absalom, for the rest of your life. And read from 1 Samuel 13 to the time that David dies, 2 Samuel. David spent most of his life battling his children. Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, clean heart, renew a right spirit in me. We sing these songs, praise you Jesus, praise you Jesus, you've forgiven me all my sins, and yet David lived with the consequences. It is absurd for you to think, Jesus, you forgive me of my sins, therefore I don't have to worry about the consequences. At four years old, which is the age of my granddaughter, I went through a glass window. And since you're a new audience, I get to tell you this great story. So I was playing Superman, black and white TV show, after the show, had a towel on, running around my living room. And some of you, this is going to freak you out. So what do you think I did? Went through a glass window. Bam! Turned around. Got a hole. Grand Canyon. I got a cool scar here. I'll show you later. Okay. Blood's coming out. Piece of glass is sitting in this vein right there, baby. My two-year-old brother's standing there. I'm crying. And I, this is my first memory. And I'm watching the blood. (laughs) And my mom comes out, genius, never went to, never went to college, came out, she saved my life, put a tourniquet, this is in, 19, 
1962. How does a housewife in 1962 know how to put a tourniquet on and where to put one on? I don't know. But she put it on right here, went over to the sink, watching the blood go down the drain. She went into the bedroom, called my father. There's no ambulances or 911. My father drives all the way back home, puts me in a car, drives me to the doctor's office. I pass out in the car, wake up in the hospital. Sorry. Mike and I want to have a conversation. <laughs> there it is, baby. Put, but, but put that, no, no, no. But put that, no, sit over there. <laughs> put that, though, on the arm of a four-year-old. Okay, this thing is the same size. Okay, so. But to this day, I'm scared, I'm scared of glass. But to this day, I'm terrified of blood. You take blood out of my arm like a blood test, boom, pass out, if I see blood. And this is no joke. If you're on the side of the road and you had an accident and you're bleeding, I am not stopping. <laughs> okay? I used to live in Puerto Rico. We mow our yards with machetes, not lawnmowers. I, that's another story. I, I got really good because I'm ambidextrous, so I can use a machete with either hand. And I'm out, and my wife's at work, and I'm going away, and I went bam. And I hit my leg, and I feel the blood going down my leg, and I'm, ooh, so I go upstairs by the house, and I sit down, and I sat. I thought, Man, I need to go to the hospital because this thing needs stitches, but I ain't lifting up my leg because I'll pass out and no one's home. I sat there for like three hours waiting for my wife to come home. She said, what's the matter? Well, you need to look at this, okay? And it really needs stitches. It didn't, it didn't have stitches. It's got a big scar. I don't know, okay? The consequence of going through that stupid window is I hate blood. But you know what the magic is? That doctor that day, in a sense, was my savior, and he saved me. But the doctor sewing up my arm did not eliminate my fear of blood. And this is why non-Christians are true when they say to us, you Christians at times somehow you downplay sin and you just talk about Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, and it doesn't matter how I live. Oh, he'll forgive you of anything that you do. That's our gospel. That's why he's a good, good father. But you will leave consequences. And you will hurt people. And we need Philemon in this book because we need to go back. Uh, as I was preparing this, at first I told you I was upset at Nathaniel for making me do this. But then later I thought, okay, I'm going to tell you later hopefully why I'm grateful to be here. Tell you about something else in the story. Oh, this ain't going to work. Okay. I hope, you, I hope this isn't midterms. Is this midterms? Yeah. Thanks a lot, Nathaniel. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. Really? All this week? I'm really impressed that you're here. I really am. Wow. Okay, well, we'll see. What I'm going to tell you now has nothing to do with what will help you with your classes. But I'm going to tell you about Philemon. And what you need to know about Philemon is the antithesis. He is a church leader. It says he had a church that met in his house. Paul prays for him. Paul says his faith in his faith and love is so well known that everybody knew who he was. There was evangelism taking place through Philemon that Paul prays about. So Philemon is the type of guy that you want to have in your church because he's a great church leader. And I tried to imagine what Philemon was thinking when he got the letter. Now I grew up in a family where my father, his best act, his best act, his best adjectives were words that I currently cannot say. And I knew them all. And I sometimes wonder maybe Philemon's going to say some of those words when he, when he gets the letter and says, uh, I don't think so. He left me. He deserted me. He's my slave. He, he broke the law. He then stole from me. He ran to Rome. And you have the audacity to write me a letter and tell me you're sending him back. Well, Paul, good for you. Because, it, Paul, it doesn't affect you, but it affects me. Why in the world... Would Philemon take him back? This is why we need Philemon, because in the letter, Paul says, Philemon, I need you to, when he comes back, I need you to receive him. And when you receive him, I need you not to accept him as a servant, bond servant, he says. I need you to accept him as a brother. And the implication is, is that there was a church that met in Philemon's house. So when Onesimus shows up, that next Sunday, when you're sitting around in your house, 
apostles' teaching, prayer, and fellowship, and then when you have the Lord's Supper, and you're about to share the bread and the wine, Philemon, you make sure that Onesimus is sitting right next to you. And you make sure you turn to him and say, here, here's the body of Christ. Here's the blood of Christ. Let's share it together as brothers. That is what Paul told Philemon he needed to do. In fact, Paul said, look, I could command you to do it, but I'm not even going to do that. Because Philemon, in order for you to accept him, you need to be willing to do it. So Paul says, I'm not going to command you to do it. I'm just going to say, Philemon, do it for the sake of love. Specifically, do it because of the love of Christ. In fact, Paul then says, look, I can't even do anything without Philemon's uh, permission. If I'm Onesimus, I'm scared to death. If I'm Onesimus, I want Paul to say in the letter, Philemon, you have to take him back. Because in the letter, it doesn't absolutely make Philemon take him back. So if he goes back, and he says, here I am, I'm, I'm repenting, I'm confessing, I stole from you, etc., etc. I want to be reconciled to you. He has no guarantee that Philemon will forgive him. And you see, when someone hurts you and they decide to, if they're going to come and repent and come to you and ask for forgiveness, they have no guarantee that you're going to forgive them. And that's why if you sin against somebody and you decide to go be reconciled to them, what terrifies you to do that is because you, know, you have no guarantee if they will accept you. And so he's telling Philemon, the gospel is more than just you believing in Jesus and going to heaven. The gospel is rest, to, be, to have restitution, reconciliation with your brother. And now that he's a Christian brother of yours, I want you to receive him. But then Paul says something else. This is where you read between the lines. Paul said, I have great confidence in you that you will do this. And then Paul has the audacity to say, to say, and you will do even more. Translation, Philemon, you will set him free. I can't think of a more powerful picture of what the gospel is. For Onesimus to go back, and then for Philemon to set him free. That's why we need Philemon. Because some of you are Onesimuses, and some of you are Philemons. Some of you have hurt some people badly. And I pray tonight that the Holy Spirit just wrestles you to the ground like he did with Jacob. To get you to say, and if I'm going to be a disciple and I'm going to be serious about Jesus and I'm going to hold on to his salvation, I'm going to sing songs about how great he is, then that means I've got to be reconciled, at least attempt to. So Lord, give me the strength and the power and the humility to go back and make restitution with those with whom you have hurt. Now, we might think that's the hardest part. I think the harder part's the other part. Some of you have been hurt dramatically by people. Maybe you've been hurt by a parent who abandoned you. Maybe you've been hurt by... I'm not even going to try to explain the pain. You, the pain, pain is pain. And some of you have been traumatically hurt and disappointed and betrayed. And one of the ways that helps you to deal with your pain is sort of in the back of your mind, well, I sure hope they never come and ask for forgiveness. <laughs> because as long as they don't, then you can continue to be angry and bitter. But God forbid that they should come to you maybe tonight, tomorrow, and say, look, what I did to you two years ago, what I did to you five years ago, I'm sorry, I repent, I'm a Christian now. Because now you're confronted as Philemon was. And the question is whether or not you're going to forgive them. Like you can come and sing songs and pray and do your, do the, go on mission trips and do all the things that Christians do. You want to really sort of reveal the true character of your, of your faith in Jesus. It's these two things. If we're willing to be reconciled in repentance and confession, and whether we're willing not willing to uh, ask for forgiveness. Okay, almost. Yeah, that's two people. There's one more person in the story that I've got to tell you about. And these people, and you might be thinking, who else is in the story? So, he mentions Timothy, he mentions Athea. Archippus, Epaphras, 
Mark, Art- Artricus, I don't care, Demas, and Luke. So I want to tell you about one more person, but it's none of them. And this person is the third straight line of the triangle. We oftentimes describe our relationship with God in mathematical terms. I have a, I have a vertical relationship with Jesus. I have a horizontal relationship with Jesus. I mean, with my brothers and sisters. So my relationship with you is just a straight line. At one end of the line is a dot. At the other end is a lot, dot. What do you call that? A line with two dots? There you go, line segment. Bingo. <laughs> I really was. In high school, I was so much better in math than in English. That's, that's another irony that I ended up becoming an English teacher. That's another story. Line segment. And all we do in our relationships with each other is, is which direction is the arrow going? So if you're trying to be reconciled to each other, the arrows are pointing in. And if you hate each other, the arrows go out. Our relationship with each other is not a line segment. Can you imagine if I asked a bunch of English majors that? Be like, I don't know. Got to look it up in Wikipedia. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Our relationships with each other is a triangle. And here's the third missing part. It's the Apostle Paul. You say, well, he just wrote the letter. You see, when you read it, you say, Onesimus, Philemon, have a disagreement. They have a broken relationship. Those two need to get together. And what the common response for us would be, you two work it out. Here, Philemon. Here, Onesimus. Here, why don't you read this nice little letter I wrote. And so often, guys, in our Christian faith, I've been a Christian too long. If that's possible, I don't know. You do not raise your hand. Okay, when I say that, do not raise your hand, okay? This is not a rhetorical thing. This is, I literally mean this. Okay. But how many of you this evening know of two, at least two, Christian brothers or sisters who are fighting and are at odds with each other right now, who are, who are separated, who had a close relationship, but they don't anymore? It could be a husband and wife. Could be a parent with a child. Could be a youth minister with someone in the church. Could just be you with your roommate. Okay? That you all know Christian brothers and sisters who this very evening are at war and it probably includes you. And I was going through Philemon and I thought, you know what we preachers do? We, we just, we're chickens. So we stand up on Sunday morning and we say, you know, you got to fight with Mike. What's your name? Leroy? Levi. Levi? Levi. 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 Too bad it's not Leroy because I had a great song to say. <laughs> but I'll do Levi. Levi and Mike. Okay. So Levi, you guys know each other? Oh, okay. How long have you known, how long have you known each other? Uh, several Two years. years. Like a married couple. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Levi and Mike. Okay. They have a they're having a fight. And this so happens. Hey, Prof. Lay. You go to church. You come to this thing like tonight. Hey, Prof. Lay. What? Did you hear? Who? What? Did you hear about Mike and Levi? Why? What happened? Well, then they tell me the falling out. So being a good preacher man I am, I go, okay, that's fine. Next Sunday, get up. And I'm going to preach about repentance. And I'm going to preach about confession. And I'm going to look at the two of you the whole time I'm preaching. <laughs> I'm never going to mention your names, but I am going to stare at you the whole time. And visitors are going to think, he's a really weirdo guy. <laughs> and I'm going to, hopefully the two of you will figure out. And so then after church, you'll, you'll meet each other out in the hallway. And you'll go, hey, I listened to the sermon. I, I did this to you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And they go, what do you, you, what do, you do? Go to the Starbucks. I don't care. <laughs> and I'm, my, I am included in this. We really enjoy driving by the highway. For those of you who drive by and see car accidents and don't stop. We really like driving by and hearing about broken relationships among people in the church and say, can you, hear, can you believe that that happened? Can you believe what has happened to them? And we do nothing about it because we say, 
it is not my fight. It's theirs, man. I'm, I'm not sticking my head between. I'm not getting involved in these two. Now, every so often, somebody will say, you know what? Someone needs to do something. What's your name? Hi, Nathan. How you doing? Do you know those two? So Nathan says, you know what? <laughs> you do now. Nathan says, I got an idea. I feel bad that these two are fighting. So Nathan decides after church, he goes over, because you two didn't listen to the sermon, and Nathan says, hey, did you hear that sermon about Philemon? Did you hear about repentance? So he's telling the two of you, and he says, I really think that the two of you need to get together, so let's go have coffee, and he's going to try to fix you up. At which point, what's your name? Uh, uh, Robert. You look like, the, <laughs> like a, you had a deer in the headlights. Like, don't pick me, don't pick me. Well, if you didn't want me to pick you, why in the world are you stand, sitting in the front row? <laughs> See, I knew it. I just gave you, as an, are you an engineering student? I just gave you the opportunity to outshine me. That's okay. I don't care. So Robert says, Nathan, what are you doing? Why are you sticking your nose in their business? Their fight is their fight. So he gets mad at Nathan for trying to get these two back together. Those are the two things I've seen. We either don't get involved, or you get involved, and then someone criticizes you for getting involved. The Apostle Paul adds a third line to the relationship. Repentance, confession, forgiveness, acceptance. And what Paul adds is advocacy. He is an advocate. Jesus is our advocate before the Father. The Holy Spirit is your advocate, advocating for you. And what Paul is doing, he's an advocate because, brothers and sisters, if Paul does not write Philemon, if Paul does not take the initiative to get the two of them back together, they're not going to get back together. So when you and I say, yeah, so and so, these two, be, these two people in my church, they've been fighting for 15 years. That is unheard of. How can you say they've been fighting for 15 years in my church and no one in the church ever intervened? You just go back and say, it is not my responsibility. Let them work it out. That's like taking two four-year-olds and putting them in a room. Okay, Johnny and Mary, you two work it out. Okay. <laughs> my four-year-old granddaughter, yesterday, no, this morning, my daughter, who's 35 years old, says to my granddaughter, who's adorable, Aubrey, eat your breakfast. And my daughter, my granddaughter turns to my daughter and says, whatever. <laughs> well, some, I'm going to t speak to the ladies. Will some lady in here tell me where does a four year old girl learn to say whatever to her mother? Now, my daughter is furious. And if we didn't have to go to school so quickly, she would have given her a time out. And I'm sitting there dying laughing. <laughs> yeah! Because as a grandparent, this is our revenge. I've waited 35 years. Because this is what you used to do to me, kid. Okay? <laughs> Guys, we cannot allow Christian brothers and sisters to, quote, work it out by themselves. It is why we have advocates. I, ask, I teach at a college where, 90, where I have 40 students, and 39 of them are athletes. They're on scholarships. So I do, I do athletic analogies all day long. And so I asked him, I said, why do professional athletes have to have coaches? That's not rhetorical. Feel free to go ahead and try to figure that one out. No, put that hand down. No, put that hand down. <laughs> Guys, you cannot be a disciple and grow in your relationship with Jesus and grow in your relationship with loving one another without advocates in your life. So if you're not, if you did not offend somebody and you do not need to forgive somebody, you need to be an advocate. So part of the time you and I are going to somebody and saying, look, I am sorry that I hurt you. Some of the time you and I need to go, look, I forgive you for hurting me. And the rest of the time, you need to be looking around and saying, I need to go be an advocate for somebody and stick your nose in their business and say, look, you two are fighting. And this is not how this is going to play out. That's what Paul does. So when Paul writes the letter, he says, 
I'm going to send Onesimus back to you even though he is of great asset to me. Paul is going to have a personal sacrifice to send him back. And Paul said, look, I like having him here. He's helpful to the ministry, but I'm going to give up my own sort of personal benefit, and I'm going to send him back. And then Paul does the most bizarre thing. He tells Philemon, I'm not going to command you to do this, Philemon, but Philemon, if Onesimus has any debt, Paul said, I will pay it. Mike looks like, not, Mike looks like, not, man, Mike looks like a nice guy. And in my 2018 Camry, I have a camera. So afterwards, Mike goes, finds my car, breaks the window, and steals the camera. <laughs> okay? And some of you said, I think Prof. Lay said to be an advocate, so they report you to the police. So you're in the Rolla Police Department right now. And so the police tell me, and I say, well, thank you for arresting him. And I say, well, Mike, uh, you will pay me for the window and the camera. And what's your name again? Yeah, I told you, Levi. Le no, no, that work. Levi says, hey, Prof. Lay, I'll buy you a new camera, and I will replace the window. I say, no, you're being an enabler. No, it's his responsibility. We need to teach him a lesson. It makes no sense for Paul to pay off Onesimus' debt, but that is what an advocate does. An advocate has a sacrifice, a price, and says, I'm not, not going to get together and say, hey, you two need to get together, and then you, you keep screaming and yelling, and you say, hey, I tried. Or I come and say, let me pray for the two of you. Three minutes later, you're still fighting. I tried. An advocate consistently, and here's why. Because Jesus consistently chases you and you turn away from him, and you walk away from him, and he just keeps following you. And he just says, I'm not going anywhere. You cannot hide from him. And he consistently follows you. The Holy Spirit is constantly trying to convict you of sin, righteousness, and truth. Because God loves you so much, he just says, I'm going to be an advocate, and I'm sticking on you. And we as advocates have to do the same. Let me close. Oh, well. Uh, I, the church I preach at, they let me preach for an hour. How long has it been? Uh, don't tell me. I don't care. <laughs> uh, I've been a pastor for many years. I've been a Bible college professor for many years. And I was a missionary for many years. Sort of covered the, covered the gamut. This really, part of this is what happens when you have ADD. Because we like to do different stuff. And I'm 61 years old. And I can't wait to what I'm going to do the next 10, 20 years of my life. Because I like change. But... Four and a half years ago, I'm not going to tell you the whole story. Uh, by the way, I'm going to be here tonight. I'm going to be here all day tomorrow, and that's on purpose. And this is, this is the sovereignty of God is why I'm here. This is the only Thursday night I can come, and it's the weekend that my wife is at a convention, and I thought, she's going to be gone all week, so why not just hang out? And that's when I decided, after I was looking at Philemon, I thought, no, I need to stay here tonight. I'm going to be at the campus house, and I'm going to be here all day tomorrow, because I'm going to tell you why. So four and a half years ago, I became an advocate, a public advocate for victims of sexual abuse, an advocate for churches who deal with sexual abuse, particularly if they cover it up. Now, what I mean by that, if you go to my Facebook page, it now says, I am an advocate. I am an advocate because something happened four and a half years ago that made me go public, where I now defend victims of sexual abuse, particularly if they were victimized by someone within the church, and I'm an advocate against churches, and if churches try to cover up sexual abuse, I will come find you. And so I've been speaking out about this for four and a half years. Wrote a book, have a website. It's a ministry that I had never planned on doing, but it's what I'm doing. And this is what I want you to know. Up until four and a half years ago, the, first, the previous 30 years as an ordained minister, I had two, maybe three people who ever came to me and said, hey, pastor, I was a victim of physical abuse or sexual abuse. Two or three people, 30 plus years. Yes, I helped them, ministered to them, helped them find resources. This is what I honestly thought. You know, sexual abuse and physical abuse is not a very big problem in my church because I've been an ordained minister for 30 some years and I've only heard two or three people talk about it. So it must be the Catholics problem. It's the Southern Baptist problem. It's not the Restoration Movement church's problem. But four and a half years ago, when I became a public advocate, and when I say public, I mean, okay, just 
afterwards, Google my name. Okay? This is one, never mind. I gotta stop. <laughs> but in the past four and a half years, I cannot tell you the number of victims who contacted me. And I had a guy contact me recently who, when he was 12, 13 years old, his youth minister groomed him, sexually molested him on multiple occasions. He then became a senior minister of a church outside in the St. Louis area, very well known. And when this victim finally became, like in his late 20s, he finally decided to come forward, went back to the church, told the church leaders, even told the Bible college, and even though they had him resign, no one at the church and no one at the college ever called the police. And they told the minister, goodbye, and he left town. And for the past 30, 40 years, he's been living in another town. Unfortunately, I may be working with children. Three, four months ago, he calls me. I do not know him. And for three hours, tells me his story. And when I said, why are you telling me? He said, because I have seen what you have done publicly in standing up for victims of sexual abuse. And when I say public, I mean it's public. And he said, I need somebody to trust, so I'm going to tell you. 2016, a former student of mine said, hey, Prof. Lay, when I was a student at a Bible college, I got drugged, raped, and threatened with a knife, and physically abused for five months. And I said, uh, no, you didn't, because she was a student of mine when I was at the Bible college. She never told anybody. In fact, she didn't tell anybody for 10 years except her husband. But in 2016, because I had gone public, she writes to me, writes me a 10-page letter of what he did to her. And I said, why are you writing to me? And she said, because you went public. Because I can trust you. This is what's been happening in the past four and a half years. I got people I don't know Physical abuse, sexual abuse, spiritual abuse, who contact me and say, Prof. Lang. But here's the other side of the coin. Okay, I'm not a, well, four years previous, I would get 20 to 30 invitations a year to go speak at a church, mainly because it, when ministers would go on vacation, go call Prof. Lang. So over a four-year period leading up to four years ago, I, I easily got over 100 invitations to go to churches, go to things like this, go to a retreat to speak. Now, because I speak, 99% I, of the people I speak to are under 100 people, so you guys are extremely frightening to speak to this many people. And as a missionary and as a Bible college professor, I have spoken in well over 100, 150 churches. Okay? So again, I haven't, I'm not going to be your top five national speakers, but I have spoken at a lot of places. And in the past four years, I have received four invitations to speak. And they've all been by one guy, Nathaniel. Nathaniel's the only one who has invited me to come speak. And I only tell you that for this reason. Some have said, you know, Prof. Lay, what a sacrifice you've made to your career to stand up for victims, and I want to say, and I really want to cuss right now, but I can't, and I want to say, hell no. And I used it in its literal sense. What I did is not a sacrifice, guys. What I did is what is the norm for every one of us. The problem is, is when someone finally decides to become an advocate and stay, stay I'm not going to take this anymore. I'm going to stand up for those Children who are being aborted. I'm going to stand up for children in foster care who are being mistreated. I will stand up for the poor. I will stand up for the oppressed. I will stand up for the least of these. I will stand up for those that have been sexually abused. I'm not just going to talk about it anymore. I'm going to become proactive. The minute you do that, these two things are going to happen to you. Victims will come out of the woodwork and they will find you because they're longing for someone to be their advocate and the religious community with which I am in, it is my profession, are so much oftentimes pharisaical. And they will destroy you as they attack Jesus because he, had, he would dare heal a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath because it was on the Sabbath that he did it. And I never would have told you this 30 years ago that the organized church would treat 
advocates this way, but they do. So every opportunity I have, I speak about this. So Philemon isn't about, specifically about abuse, but what I'm telling you is, it's repentance, it's confession, and it's being an advocate. So I'm going to pray here in a second. I am here tonight. In fact, I'm staying at the campus house. I told Nathaniel, I just, I'm going to, I want to sleep somewhere in the campus house. For those of you who sleep in the campus house, you'd better get home early because I'm taking your bed. <laughs> okay. So whoever stays out till 3 o'clock in the morning to study, you sleeping on the floor, okay? Because I'm too old to sleep on the floor and I'm sleeping in your bed. Okay? It is God ordained that he gave me the book of Philemon and it's God ordained that I end up, I'm going to stay here tonight. I'm going to be here all day tomorrow. And I'm going to be at the campus house. And all I'm going to say is, anybody wants to ch chat, talk, I'll let the Holy Spirit lead you. I'm going to be here to talk. Let's pray. Father, you don't like it when your disciples get serious about you. So I just pray tonight that these men and women, they're not just here studying at the school and pre preparing their careers. And I know, Father, that they are, and I'm assuming their parents and others have prayed for their success in their careers. Father, I pray for their success in being a disciple of yours. And so, Father, this message is disjointed, and you, how you ever use whatever I say is amazing to me. But, Father, your spirit and your word are powerful enough that I'm just going to trust you that you will use your spirit and your word this evening to speak to whoever is here as to decisions they need to make, commitments they need to make, conversations they need to have. And that, Father, that your sovereignty will reign and your glory will reign here tonight. And that, Father, that there will be some people tonight who came here tonight and had no clue that they were going to meet you in a way in which they had never imagined before to experience the full extent of the gospel, whether they need to repent and restore a relationship, whether they need to forgive a Christian brother or sister, or whether they need to be an advocate for two brothers and, Christ two brothers and sisters in the Lord who are fighting with each other. Father, I love this chance, and I just pray your, your protection and blessing on each man and woman here this evening. Father, keep them strong in your Holy Spirit. Let them be a valuable voice for you. In Jesus' name, amen.